The State Capitol Building in Nashville is one of the architectural and historical treasures of Tennessee and of the entire nation. Completed before the start of the Civil War, this National Historic Landmark is one of the nation's oldest working state houses still in use. A structure of great artistic beauty, the Tennessee State Capitol is also the seat of government and a place that embodies the rich history of this state. It has stood for over 150 years and witnessed events of great importance to the American people. Many people, great and ordinary, have passed through its marble corridors. Presidents, school children, famous singers, and tourists alike. The state capitol is without question the premier historic building in Tennessee, an iconic symbol of our identity as Tennesseans. It is one of the classically beautiful state houses of America. Following the admission of Tennessee as a state in 1796, the location of its capital changed five times, moving from Knoxville to Kingston for a day, to Nashville to Murfreesboro, and back to Nashville. Tennessee's Constitution of 1834 stipulated that the legislature select a permanent location for the state capital. Years later, Governor James C. Jones, himself a Nashvillian, advocated on behalf of his rapidly growing commercial and industrial city near the center of the state. After a lengthy discussion in which dozens of Tennessee towns were proposed, the 1843 General Assembly resolved that Nashville be designated the permanent seat of state government. Nashville Mayor Powhatan Maxey purchased a stony prominence near the center of town owned by attorney George W. Campbell for $39,000. The civic leaders then deeded this landmark hill as a gift to the state of Tennessee with the condition that it be used as the site of the new capital. A better site could not have been chosen. The hill towered some 200 feet above the Cumberland River and could be seen by travelers approaching the city from miles away. This rocky acropolis was well suited to the seat of state government that would shortly be built on its heights. State leaders wanted a capital building that would reflect Tennessee's leading role on the national stage. Tennessee was one of the fastest growing and most economically vibrant states in what was then the American West. And personalities such as David Crockett and Sam Houston symbolized this state's strong connection with America's westward expansion. Tennesseans wielded considerable influence in the affairs of the nation. None, of course, had more impact than Andrew Jackson, who so dominated American politics in the 1830s and 40s that the era came to be known as the Age of Jackson. With Jackson and his successor, James K. Polk, as presidents, the torch had passed from wealthy aristocrats to the heroes of the common man. It was finally time for Tennessee to have a state house in keeping with its economic and political importance. The new capital would need to be a grand architectural affair, but also reflect the solid grassroots values that won America's admiration during the age of Jackson. To design and build such an edifice, state leaders turned to one of the foremost architects in the Greek Revival style, William Strickland of Philadelphia. Strickland had worked on the United States Capitol with his mentor, Benjamin Latrobe, and built the steeple on Independence Hall in Philadelphia. The Tennessee State Capitol would become the crowning achievement of Strickland's career. He and Samuel Morgan, the chairman of the Capitol Commission and overseer of the construction of the Capitol, both dedicated the latter parts of their lives to raising the grand building that is still with us today. These two men are, according to their wishes, buried within its walls. Strickland designed the state capitol to be a Greek-style temple of democracy, 236 feet by 109 feet, with a tower that brings its height to 206 feet. 
The tower features Corinthian columns and an ornate lantern modeled directly on an ancient monument in Athens, the cradle of democracy in Greece. Emphasizing the idea of solidity and grandeur and to minimize the risk of fire, the capital was constructed as an all-stone building, a rarity at the time. Despite all-stone construction and its elegant appearance, the building of the capital was a model of frugality. Its total cost upon completion after 14 years of construction was estimated at $880,000. Native Tennessee materials were used whenever possible. The limestone was quarried only a mile from the site at Samuel Watkins Quarry on what is now Charlotte Avenue. The state saved considerable money by having the limestone worked by inmates from the state penitentiary and by slaves hired from their masters. Much of the skilled hand dressing and polishing of the stone was done by Irish and Scots-Irish stonemasons. As many as 240 men labored to quarry, prepare, and set the stone, with the exception of their initials carved in the giant blocks. These men are largely anonymous to us today. Interior stonework, such as stairways, balustrades, and mantles were made from varied colors of East Tennessee marble from Hawkins and Knox County. The beautiful marbles of East Tennessee were already famous, having been used in the construction of the United States Capitol and the Washington Monument. Glass for the windows came from the Holston Glass Works and the iron trusses for the roof from the Cumberland Iron Works of Stewart County. Following an elaborate Masonic cornerstone laying ceremony on July 4th, 1845, workmen began quarrying stone blocks for the walls and excavating perches for them in the bedrock of the site. Four feet of the hill's crest were removed to create a level stratum on which to place the first blocks. The foundation of the capital was built of stone seven feet thick, the upper walls being four and a half feet thick. The stones were so expertly cut and fitted that the average mortar joint is less than 3 sixteenths of an inch. The stone construction created challenges in handling the tremendous weight, which Strickland solved with the use of weight-bearing stone piers, buttresses, and vaulted crypts. The next level contained the chambers of the federal court, state supreme court, the governor's office, the secretary of state, the treasurer, and the comptroller. The main two-story level contains the Senate and House chambers and the state library room. The prevalence of interior stone walls can be seen in the grand interior space of the building's largest room, the House of Representatives. The 16 columns here are each carved of 21-foot single pieces of limestone quarried directly from bedrock like the obelisks of ancient Egypt. James Sloan provided the red Tennessee marble for the speaker's rostrum and screen. The other great room on this second level is the ornate Senate chamber. Unlike the house chamber, which is made almost entirely of limestone, the smaller Senate chamber has 12 solid marble columns of varied colors and an entablature that support a gallery around the top of the room. One can still see the outline of Strickland's marble mantle and fireplace on the wall of the chamber. An 80-foot tower soars upward from the center of the capital at the cross of its four wings. The square base of the tower is made of rusticated stone, while the elegant lantern feature that rises above it is rounded and smaller in diameter. A 10-ton foliated iron finial manufactured in Nashville by T.M. Brennan Foundry, crowns the lantern. The whole structure weighs 4,000 tons, and heavy piers outside the house chamber anchor this weighty vertical tower. Building it involved lifting 10-ton stone blocks 150 feet into the air by means of ropes and spars. Remarkably, there were no known fatalities during construction. Some manufactured items, such as the copper sheets for the roof, the chandeliers, and the elaborate ironwork were made outside Tennessee. One prime example was the spectacular gaslight chandeliers, or gasoliers, for the main rooms of the Capitol, made by the Cornelius and Baker firm of Philadelphia. 
Gaslighting was a new and rare technology during the 1850s, and for many years after their installation, newspapers in Nashville would announce to the public the nights when the lights would be lit. Visitors would come to enjoy the spectacle. The 48 burner gasolier in the house chamber was the grandest of them all. It was said to be the largest chandelier in the United States. Measuring 21 feet in length, it consisted of 48 lights with Indian warriors, buffaloes, corn, and tobacco plants hung throughout. It cost $1,500 and was so large and heavy that it made legislators who sat beneath it nervous. So much so that they eventually had it removed and sold for scrap. Smaller gasoliers adorned the corridors, the Senate chamber, the Supreme Court room, and the State Library. Four originals remain to this day. On October 3rd, 1853, the General Assembly met in the Capitol for the first time, though it was by no means completed. Work on the building proceeded until the time of Strickland's death in 1854. His funeral ceremony was conducted in the House Chamber. Strickland's son, Francis, took over the project after his father's death. He is responsible for finishing his father's design of the tower, which to this day is considered the crowning piece of the building. In 1857, the Capitol Commission fired Francis Strickland and hired the British architect Harvey Ackroyd to finish the terraces and the State Library, the last part of the building to be completed. The ornate State Library was a jewel in the new capital. Rich red carpeting and matching red draperies set off the splendor of the scrubbed gray stone walls. 40-foot pilasters ran from floor to ceiling with 15-foot high windows and a double tier of lacy ironwork around the balconies. The room's iron spiral staircase and dazzling ceilings with frescoed portraits set in lavender and gray completed the interior. The March 1859 laying of the last stone in the terrace is regarded as the traditional completion date for the building. The capital was not, however, landscaped and the interior was barely furnished when the crisis of the Civil War intervened. As war clouds gathered, Tennessee secessionist governor Isham Harris carried the state into the Confederacy in the spring of 1861. Less than a year later, after the fall of Fort Donelson and the hurried evacuation of Nashville by Southern troops, Union soldiers captured Nashville without firing a shot and marched up to the Capitol. The building thus became the first state house of the Confederacy to fall into Union hands. The conquering army needed to raise a flag and Nashvilleian William Driver, an old sea captain, provided one. Driver brought out his cherished ship's flag, which he had nicknamed Old Glory, climbed above the east entrance and hoisted it up the flagstaff. Soldiers and civilians began to refer to the American flag as Old Glory, and the name stuck. Captain Driver is buried at the city cemetery in Nashville, where the American flag flies 24 hours a day by special congressional approval. His Old Glory is stored at the National Museum of American History in Washington, D.C. The building was also pressed into service as a hospital for wounded soldiers following the Battle of Stones River, as a barracks and later as a fortress known as Fort Andrew Johnson. A crude stockade of cedar logs was built around the building, and 15 cannon were placed in earthworks to repel an expected Confederate attack. In December 1864, Governor Andrew Johnson watched the Battle of Nashville from the Capitol's tower and gave orders to blow up the building if the Confederates actually threatened the city. All things considered, the new state capital came through the devastation of the great Civil War relatively unscathed. The major challenge of resuming normal operations was to dismantle the wartime fortifications and landscape the barren grounds. In the 1870s, the landscape on Capitol Hill changed drastically to accommodate cedar trees, an enclosing stone wall, pedestrian entrances, and iron gates. 
Graceful steps and paved walkways laced across Capitol Hill, and the park-like grounds became one of the favorite places in Nashville to stroll. By 1900, years of constant use had taken a toll on the Capitol's interior, and the state legislature made a special appropriation of $10,000 to prevent the deterioration of the building. The beautifully frescoed ceilings of the halls, the Senate, House of Representatives, and library were cleaned, re-emerging from under a layer of grime. Although during its early years, fashionable homes had sprung up around the Capitol, the neighborhood had deteriorated with time. After World War I, the scale of government business began to far outstrip the capacity of the Capitol building. It became necessary to purchase surrounding properties on which to build state offices. One after another, the shabby buildings were reduced to rubble as bulldozers cleared the area. With funds from the Public Works Administration in the 1930s, a wave of construction began to relieve the Capitol's overcrowded condition. Such funds helped build the Tennessee Supreme Court and John Sevier State Office Building near the Capitol. The new Supreme Court building allowed the judiciary to move to its own quarters, the first time that a branch of state government left the Capitol. The interior of the Capitol was also renovated. The governor's suite was expanded and remodeled with Georgian Revival style woodwork and 11 mural panels painted by artist Gear R. Zorthan, depicting allegorical scenes from Tennessee history. Quarters that had been occupied by the federal court were reconstructed and refurnished for the Secretary of State. In the 1950s, more extensive redevelopment of property around Capitol Hill led to the construction of the Cordell Hull Building and the State Library and Archives. Along with the new construction, the Capitol Building needed repairs. The local limestone that the builders had used in order to save money had a fatal flaw. It was too soft to withstand the ravages of time. The acid formed by rain and Nashville's coal smoke and wear and tear from heavy use had taken a toll on the crumbling stone. The situation was so bad that some suggested tearing down the Capitol and putting up a new building. The state architect responded by stating, that's a question that really doesn't need answering. If our history means anything, tearing down the Capitol would be unthinkable. If the historic capital was to survive, much of the stone would have to be removed and replaced with something more durable. Thus, the plan for renovation was to largely rebuild the century-old capital so that it would last another century while preserving its historical character. Approximately 90,000 cubic feet of the original limestone were replaced by a harder limestone from Indiana at a cost of $2 million. Much of the exterior stonework was redone, including the crumbling cornices, porticos, and pediments. The 28 majestic columns which surround the building were replaced by brand new columns. Considerable stone in the tower's lantern was replaced, and a new copper roof was installed. Most of the interior work was along practical lines. Air conditioning vents were wrestled into the thick stone walls. Arch ceilings were scrubbed, replastered, and repainted. The original limestone floor was ripped up and new marble flooring installed. The old first floor courtrooms and the ground level were transformed into offices. In the Capitol basement, Electricians snaked miles of electric cable into switch boxes to bring fluorescent lighting and filtered air into the windowless rooms. In the final stage of the 1950s renovations, the 300-foot-long Motlow Tunnel was built 25 feet beneath the south side of the Capitol, providing convenient access from Charlotte Avenue. This was, as one reporter put it, the unkindest cut of all, because it eliminated the century-long tradition of climbing the steps of Capitol Hill to get to the legislative chambers. In 1984, efforts were made to restore many of the 19th century features that had been covered up or lost during subsequent renovation. 
Within four years, the leaking roof and exterior stonework were repaired, and the State Library and Supreme Court Chamber were restored to their original state of elegance. In 1996, the area directly to the north of Capitol Hill was configured as an urban mall and state historical park named the Bicentennial Capitol Mall State Park. This contained the site of the original Sulphur Spring and Salt Lick, which attracted large game hunters and traders to the area in the 1700s. During another renovation in 2012, workers discovered high vaulted ceilings in the small clerk's offices along the House of Representatives chamber, for years hidden by drop ceilings. On the ground floor, architects found the structure's original brick vaults. The decision to restore the vaults and arches was a fitting tribute to the ingenious classicism of the original building. The Capitol has hosted many unusual events over a century and a half. One such event was the dedication of the equestrian statue of Andrew Jackson in 1880. Thousands swarmed around the grounds and even onto the roof and enjoyed a grand show of fireworks that evening. Another huge event featured a thrilling stunt performed in 1911 when Mr. H.W. Major drove a Ford Coupe from Charlotte Avenue up the Capitol steps, through the building, and down the other side. The feat attracted thousands of curiosity seekers who wanted to see what the new gas buggy could do. In the summer of 1920, all eyes were on Tennessee as the General Assembly considered adopting the 19th Amendment to the Constitution. 36 states were required for ratification and 35 had already passed the measure giving American women the right to vote. Harry T. Byrne, a 24-year-old freshman Republican, cast the deciding vote in one of the truly momentous votes taken in Strickland's Capitol building. Tennessee went down in history as the perfect 36, the state that put women's suffrage over the top. Tennessee has affected the history of the country and shaped the world in many ways. Outside the Capitol are statues and monuments celebrating famous Tennesseans. In addition to Jackson's statue, the grounds include the tomb of President and Mrs. James K. Polk, and the statue of World War I hero Alvin C. York, the embodiment of Tennessee's volunteer spirit. The General Assembly flag that flies over the Capitol beneath the American and Tennessee flags is rich in symbolism. Red for America, blue for respect of Tennessee, and white for purity. The three stars represent the three grand divisions of the state. Golden wheat symbolizes the agricultural heritage of the state, and the gavel represents the power of the people as vested in the state's legislative body. The flag flies above the Capitol only when the General Assembly is in session. To this day, the state capitol stands proud as an edifice of democratic government. It stands not only for our government, but for the people and events that have shaped the volunteer state. This graceful building still reminds us of the forward-looking vision of those who built it. Perhaps more than any other structure that is still with us today, the Capitol embodies Tennessee's rich heritage. Dignified and majestic, it is a symbol of innovation that is grounded in tradition. <laughs>